What's up, North Shore Youth? How y'all doing? Are we good? Somebody say America. America. Man, I feel I feel a little bit weird preaching in like America cut off and all the stuff. It's fine. It's fine. Even though it's America, it's still spooky season. Come on, somebody who loves spooky season. Anybody? This is one of the best times of year. Uh, before we get into that, though, um, if you are here for the very first time and I haven't met you yet, my name is Dylan. I am the youth pastor here at North Shore, and I would love to meet you. So come and talk to me after service. I don't normally dress like this. I promise I'm not a weird guy. Well, I am a weird guy, but not in this sort of way. Um, so come and talk to me after service. I will get you something free from our snack sack just to say thank you for being here. And if you like to take notes during the message, go ahead and raise your hand. Some of my ghost crew team is going to come around with pens and notes, and so you can get those from them. But one thing really quick. Somebody say one thing. Please do not destroy the pens. I feel like I have to say this all the time, and there are one or two people that still destroy the pens. You're like trying to milk the pen like it's a cow to get the ink out of it or something. Please don't do that. It ruins our floor. It ruins our chairs. It ruins our pens, and it ruins everybody's good time. So please don't destroy the pens. Raise your hand if you want to take notes. They'll get you some pens and notes. You can raise those really, really high. But also, who loves spooky season? Somebody say yes if you do. Yes? Yeah. Oh, man, I love this time of year. What is your, what's your favorite part? I know that you guys are looking for notes and stuff, but what, what's your favorite part about spooky season? Candy? You get candy from strangers? Yes, that's my favorite. I love stranger candy. What, why else? Why do you love spooky season? The weather is amazing. You can, you can literally wear like a hoodie and shorts and be perfect. Why else do you love spooky season? Anybody? Why do you love spooky season? Because you can eat candy and it's really good. Does anybody love pumpkin patches? Anybody love pumpkin patches? Does anybody love carving pumpkins? Does anybody love smashing pumpkins? You're the worst. Man, don't smash the pumpkins. There is a mosquito in here. It is a warm, spooky season right now. I love the temperatures. I love, hey, who loves scary movies? Anybody love scary movies? Oh, yes. Honestly, that's, that's probably one of my favorite things. That's probably one of my all-time favorite things about spooky season is scary movies because I, I love slasher flicks. I love horror movies. I love like, like ghost story movies. Anybody love that kind of stuff, like paranormal activity? I love those kind of movies. Maybe I shouldn't love those things, but I do. And I even love costumes. Costumes are so fun. Does anybody still dress up for Halloween and go trick-or-treating? A few of you. Even if you don't go trick-or-treating, does anybody still dress up for Halloween? Is anybody going to dress up for Halloween next Wednesday for costume night? Let's go. It's going to be so good. It's going to be so good. Um, I, uh, I love, I love, I love costumes. I love costumes. In fact, my wife and I, over the years, we've been a part of a few different trunk or treats. And so we've gotten to dress up as different themes. And it's so much fun to, like, be creative and think through all the costumes. One year, we were the cast from Up. I think I have a picture of it. There it is. I'm the old guy. I think my wife was, uh, was Russell. Quinn was the, uh, the, the Kevin, the bird. And then Blake was the dog, Doug. Doug the dog. That was really fun. Uh, we've actually been the cast of Up twice. Before we had kids, we dressed up with some of our friends. I was Russell for that one, and Erica was Doug, and some of our friends were the, the old guy and Kevin. What's the old guy's name? Mr. Fredrickson, thank you so much. How do I not know that? So we've been the cast of Up a couple of times. Um, let's see, we were Goldilocks and the Three Bears one year. I got to be Papa Bear, and I'll be honest with you, that bear suit was pretty snug. Um, in, the, in the worst places. Uh, one year, we were uh, the cows from Chick-fil-A, and that was really, really fun. We got signs that say, eat more chicken, and Quinn's the chicken down there at the bottom, and so that was really fun. Uh, one year, we were Castaway. This was before we had kids. I was Tom Hanks from Castaway, and Erica was Wilson. That was a good one. Uh, this one is probably my favorite, though. We went as Bob Ross. Who remembers Bob Ross? Come on, somebody, right? And so I was Bob Ross. Erica was the happy little tree. 
And if you know anything about Bob Ross, he's got pet squirrels, and so our daughter Quinn was my pet squirrel. And, uh, and we, we love dressing up. We love dressing up in costumes. We love going out for Halloween and going trick-or-treating and taking our kids. And, and, and my son Uriah, he's going to be three years old in December. And uh, yeah, he is cute. Um, and, uh, and, and he's in that stage where it's not just Halloween time. He wants to wear a costume all the time. How many of you remember that stage of life, right? You have costumes in your house. You're like, I got to put this thing on because I'm going to be Spider-Man. Yes? Right? He, he'll just, he'll run into the playroom and he'll grab a costume and he'll bring it out and ask us to put it on him. And as soon as that costume is on, he is that person. Like if we put a Spider-Man costume on him, he's trying to stick to walls. He's jumping off things. He's like, he, he's going off. We, we've got uh, a Hulk costume and sometimes he'll put on the Hulk costume and he'll just try to punch walls. Like he'll try to punch everything in sight. Like that's just how it goes. Uh, sometimes we'll, we'll let him get into the Woody costume and, and he'll literally act like he is a toy that has just come to life and, and he just takes on the persona of the costume that he's wearing. Does this make sense? Yeah. How many of you have been there? You ever worn a costume and you're like, I got to be this character? Anybody? That's just kind of how it goes. But I, I don't, I don't want to just talk about costumes in, in the way of Halloween. I want to talk about something a little bit different tonight because the, the title of my message tonight is No Costumes Allowed. No Costumes Allowed. This, this does not go for next week. Please wear your Halloween costumes as long as they are appropriate. Somebody say appropriate. appropriate. Like Elsa said, if you have to question whether or not you should wear it, then you should not wear it. Come up with something else. Uh, but the title of my message tonight is No Costumes Allowed. And the reason for that is I think a lot of us, uh, we, we take on the persona of the costume that we choose to wear. I'll say that again. For a lot of us, we take on the persona of the costume that we choose to wear. And, and so it says no costumes allowed, but every single one of us have broken that rule because we are constantly tempted to put on costumes or facades or performances that make us seem more successful and more stable and stronger than we actually are. And this, this happens even inside church. Did you know that? Somebody say yes. Th this happens in the church as well. We put on our church costume because we want people to be impressed with how spiritual we are, right? We want people to be impressed with how much we raise our hands and how much we say amen. Somebody say amen. amen. That's very impressive. I'm very proud of you guys. That was good. That was really good. No, but th this, is, this is what happens. We put on our church costume because we want everybody to think that we are super spiritual and, and, and perfect. And we use that, that spiritual perfection as a costume, as a mask to cover up our weaknesses, to cover up our mistakes, to cover up our sins, to cover up our difficulties, to cover up our struggles. Whatever it is, we, we all want to cover those things up. Yes? Is this true? We, we don't like people to know our stuff, right? Or wrong. Do you like people to know your stuff? No, not really. And so we, we try to cover things up and we try to put on these costumes to appear like we have everything together. We don't want anyone to know what's really going on underneath the surface. We, uh, we just finished our series called Kingdom Culture. Did you enjoy that series? Yes? Man, I, I had so much fun with that series. And in that series, if, if you weren't here for that, we presented to you the four core values of who we are at North Shore Youth, that, that this is who we are going to be, that we exist for those who are not here yet, right? Right? Four core values of North Shore Youth, this is kind of who, who we want to be. Because we exist for those who are not here yet, yes? yes. There we go. That, that we will be disciples who make disciples, Yes. That we understand that it is about we and not about me. Somebody say we. we. That we understand that serving is not just something that we do, but it is who we are. Yes? yes? And so we talk through the four core values of who we are at North Shore Youth, but I feel like tonight's message could be a fifth core value, that here at North Shore Youth there are no costumes allowed. That, that in the kingdom we understand that there are no costumes allowed because Jesus sees beyond the costume anyways. Yes? Does this make sense? Are you following where I'm going? Somebody say yes. yes. I hope you're not lying to me. We're, we're, we're not going to allow this to be a place where we hide our hurts and we lie about what's going on in our lives to make people think more of us. Instead, we are going to be honest about our struggles because we need to understand the truth is, is that humility and honesty are the beginnings of healing. All of, all of us, all of us have hurts, yes? 
All of us have struggles, yes? Have you ever been hurt by somebody? Do you ever struggle with stuff? And so we need to let this place not be a place of, 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 of costumes and where we're judging other people and so other people feel like they have to wear their church costume and put on a facade to, to look more spiritual than we are. We want this to be a place of humility and honesty because that's the place where, where healing begins. Healing begins in our lives when we get to that place where we can be honest about what we are struggling with. And, and if we're going to be healthy in our relationship with Jesus, it starts with being humble enough and being honest about the unhealthy parts of our life and allowing Jesus to begin to work in those things. Does this make sense? You guys are being very quiet. I can't tell if you're not following me or if you're really, really listening. What are you doing? Okay, good. I like that. I like that. Somebody say America. America. All right. Just want to make sure you guys are still with me. So the truth is, Somebody say the truth. The truth is, is that we all want to appear better than we actually are. Yes? Uh, this, is, this is the whole premise behind social media. That, that people only post them best selves online. Yes? Like, we're not posting the worst parts of us online. We're not posting the actually just woke up like this picture. Yeah? Right? Like, we, we post the picture, just woke up or woke up like this. It's like, no, you didn't. You, you look too good to have just woken up. You at least scraped the crusty drool off your face, right? You don't post those actual pictures. Social media is, is, is key when it comes to us putting the best parts of ourselves out there, of, of, of putting a costume on so that people will think that we are better than we actually are. Uh, Reed actually just recently introduced me to an app called Be Real. Anybody have Be Real? Yeah, Be Real. Right? And, and when I first downloaded it, I was, I was kind of stoked on it because... I, I was thinking to myself, like, okay, this is actually a, a social media app where people will be real, yes? Right? But then you, you start getting into it, and you realize people doctor these up just as much as they doctor up Instagram. Yeah? Uh, if, if the app really wanted to be real, then as soon as it sent out that, that notification that you got two minutes which is ridiculous. You got two minutes to take the picture and then delete it and edit it and make sure that everything in the picture looks good and then you can finally post it. If it really wanted to be real, it would just take the picture immediately, right? No matter what you're doing, it takes the picture. It removes the option to delete it. It just puts it out there. You can't delete anything, right? This is a part of the terms and conditions. Who wants that kind of app? Anybody? That it doesn't even give you the opportunity to caption what the picture is of? Who's going to download that? Nobody. A couple of you who are raising your hands, you are lying. What if it took a nasty picture of you and posted it up there? That's not good, right? No, nobody wants to do that. Why? Because it's risky. Yes? It's risky. It's risky to feel vulnerable. It's risky to feel like there are people out there who could know our stuff. And so what do we do? We put on the costume. Am I wrong? Are you guys following me? Vulnerability is, is, is risky. But I don't think that vulnerability is always a bad thing. I, in, in, in the culture that we live in, we're, we're taught to be self-sufficient. We're taught to be strong. We're taught to be stable. We're, we're not supposed to be vulnerable around people. We want everybody to think the best of us. But I don't think vulnerability is, is all that bad because the Bible tells us that when we are weak, when we are vulnerable, Jesus is strong. Yes? That, that in our weaknesses, Jesus is still strong. How many of you know Paul? Anybody know Paul? We talk about Paul quite a bit here at North Shore Youth. So Paul was one of the most prolific writers in all of the New Testament. And, and so he wrote most of the New Testament. And he planted a whole bunch of churches after he gave his life to Christ. And, and one of the churches that he planted was in this city called Corinth. And in the New Testament, you'll find two books or two letters that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church called First and Second Corinthians. And in Second Corinthians, Paul paints this picture of the struggles that he's facing. He, he gets very vulnerable with the church in Corinth to let them know, I've got stuff going on in my life, but God is still good. Yes? Yeah. This, is, this is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Paul, Paul's telling the Corinthians about an issue that he has, about a thorn that he's got in his side, that this, this, this chronic pain that he's experiencing, and he's gone to God about it and said, God, I want you to take care of this in my life. And this is how God responds to him. He says, my grace is all you need. Somebody say all. He says, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Listen, y'all, when, when we feel vulnerable, 
when, when we feel like our stuff is, is out there for everybody to see, God is working. Yeah? yeah. What in the world? This mosquito is really getting after me. <laughs> when, 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 we, when we feel the most vulnerable, God is working. Yes? Yeah. Say yes. Yeah. So Paul says, God is responding to him. He says, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. And so now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. And and so we have to understand the truth here is that our weakness glorifies God because it points to the true source of our strength. Our our weakness glorifies God because it points to the true source of our strength. The, the, The source of Paul's strength was not himself. The source of Paul's preaching ability was not himself. The source of Paul's ability to plant churches was not himself. The the source of Paul's ability to go through hardships like shipwreck and and, and being beaten and whipped and imprisoned and and, and later on killed, these things were not of Paul. He didn't do all of these things in his own strength. He had physical struggles that he was working with and dealing with, but his weakness showed God moving. In his weakness, God was still moving, and that brings glory to God. God was glorified through Paul's weakness. Does this make sense? And so in a world that elevates self-sufficiency, I think that our tendency is to think the worst thing that could ever happen to us is somebody finding out about our weaknesses or that we would have to admit our weaknesses to each other. But Paul's entire letter to the Corinthian church is a testimony of the way that sharing our struggles and sharing our weaknesses with other people encourages other people and glorifies God. But but how does this work? How how does this work out in our real life? Because it seems kind of counterintuitive, right? That this whole idea seems a little bit backwards that that by us removing the mask by us removing our costume and talking about our own weaknesses that 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 would honor god does it ever feel like that's kind of weird anybody feel like that's weird like shouldn't it be that if you love jesus you should hide your struggles because you want to protect your testimony shouldn't it be that that if you if you love jesus that that if you are struggling with stuff you can't tell anybody about it because it might taint people's idea of who christ is Can I tell you, this is a lie from Satan himself. For us to believe that we can't share our weaknesses, that we can't be vulnerable about what we have going on because it might destroy what Jesus could do in somebody else's life, that's a lie straight from Satan himself because he wants you to believe that you cannot be honest because being honest will impact your faith or your ability for your faith to impact other people, that it will somehow taint your testimony, that it will somehow make Jesus unable to work in somebody else's life because you have issues in your own and and, and people are going to think less of you and and, and even worse, people are going to think less of Jesus. This is a lie from the enemy. The truth is, can I tell you the truth? Is that okay? The truth is, is that transparency points more people to Jesus than pretending does. Transparency is going to point more people to Jesus than our pretending ever could. Can I, can I tell you this? There is not one thing that is better in pointing a, an addict to Jesus than another addict who has been set free by Jesus. Come on. And if we pretend that we never have any issues, we're never going to be able to use those issues to point people to the one who can fix those issues. And so transparency points people to Jesus more than our pretending ever could when when we're transparent we're not pointing to how great we are we're pointing to how great jesus is in spite of our struggles that that even though we are not perfect jesus still loves us perfectly and that he's working in our lives to heal our brokenness and bring us victory over our struggles and over sin and over everything else that's going on in our life and and as life change happens in that process we can point everything back to the person who brought the life change in the first place which is Jesus. Does this make sense? This is, this is called a testimony. That, that I was once broken, but because of Jesus, I have been made whole. That is a testimony. That I was once addicted, but because of Jesus, I have been set free. And I can share that vulnerability, I can share that struggle with somebody who's going through the same thing because it's, it's not about me. 
I'm not trying to bolster my own clout and put on a costume to make people think better of me. No, I'm going to point to what Jesus has done in me. I am broken, but Jesus made me whole. Does this make sense? It's called a testimony. A testimony comes from transparency in our lives. What has, what has God done in our lives in spite of our sin, in spite of our failures, in spite of our weakness? We get to point to what he is doing. And we can share, we, we, we can't share our testimony while wearing a costume. Hear me? You, you can't share your testimony while pretending to be better than you actually are. It's not a real testimony anyway. Because the costume covers up the work that Jesus is doing underneath. And so again, our weakness glorifies God because it points to the true source of our strength. We're not the ones who fix ourselves. Right? We, we don't fix ourselves. This is Jesus' work in our lives. And so we've got to be transparent. There's another thing that transparency does. It removes any temptation toward taking credit for Jesus' work in our lives. When, when we're transparent, we're not trying to point to ourselves. We're not trying to say, I fixed myself. I made myself better. I got myself clean. I made myself whole. We, we're not doing that. It, it removes the, the temptation to take credit for what Jesus is actually doing in our lives. Because we understand that when we are weak, when we are stripped of our constant temptation to think that our hard work and our talents are sufficient for accomplishing anything of value. When, when we allow transparency to strip those things away, Jesus can begin to work not just in our lives, but in the lives of those around us, in the lives of other people who are struggling and hurting and need hope, and they need you to tell them that Jesus made you whole. Come on. And so instead we bring him glory when we acknowledge the fact that, that we are incapable without him, that on our own we can't fix our brokenness. All we can do is hide it, mask it, put on a costume to conceal it. But there, there, is, there is hope in this, right? Does anybody feel like this is a little bit heavy? A little bit heavy-handed? Like, oh, man, like we're talking about costumes. Like, I, I, I don't want you to, to put my stuff on display. I, I don't want you to know my business. I, I don't want you to know what I struggle with. I get that. There's not a whole lot of people that do, but God is at work in those things, yes? And there's something amazing that happens when, when we allow Jesus to begin to work on our lives in a real way. Not, not in a doctored up way, not in a, I put my mask on and, and, and I'll go to Jesus and I'll kind of try to pretend like I'm doing better than I actually am. Do you know Jesus sees your heart anyways? Yeah? And so there's something cool that happens when, when we get this kind of vulnerability level with Jesus and with others. Paul, earlier in his letter to the Corinthians, he says this in 2 Corinthians 4, he says, we now have this light shining in our hearts. So, so this is what happens when, when we decide to say yes to Jesus. When we stop hiding, when we stop pretending, when we stop masking our issues and trying to bolster ourselves to look better in front of people, when we stop doing all of that and we actually go to Jesus, Jesus begins to work in our lives and he puts a light in our lives so that we can share that light with other people. So it says, we now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile. Somebody say fragile. fragile. We are breakable jars of clay containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. Come on. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but we are never abandoned by God. We are knocked down, but we are not destroyed. And so again, when, when we allow Jesus to speak into our lives, when we allow Jesus to come in and, and fix those broken places because we got honest with ourselves and we got honest with Jesus and we got honest with somebody else who could speak truth into our lives, Jesus begins to work and he begins to fix those broken places. And, and, and instead of hiding all of this from people, Jesus begins to put a light in our lives that shines for other people. Yes? But Paul says something a little bit strange here. He's talking about this light that's inside of us, but then he shifts gears pretty quickly, and he says, fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. He says we're fragile. Somebody say fragile. fragile. What does it mean to be fragile? Easily what? Easily breakable. Easily breakable, right? That seems kind of like an insult, yes? For Paul to say you are easily breakable. 
What, how, how would you feel, boys, if somebody came up to you and said, you're easily breakable, what would you do? You're trying to start a wrestling match with them, right? I'll show you how easily breakable I am, right? Is it right? Am I lying? This is true. If somebody came up to you and said, you're fragile, you're easily breakable, you're like, bet, right? Let's go. I will show you how easily breakable I am. But the thing is, 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 is Paul isn't, he's not testing us. This isn't Paul trying to at you. He's not trying to degrade you or, 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 or shame you or make you feel less than. What he's saying, he's, he's showing the relative unimportance and fragility of those who carry the light as opposed to the infinite worth and strength of the light himself. I want to say that again. What Paul is doing is he's showing us the relative unimportance and fragility of those who carry the light, which is us. That we are fragile. This is the truth as opposed to the infinite worth and strength of the light himself, which is Jesus. That, that, that we are not great because we have Jesus, but that Jesus is great for putting his presence in something so fragile like us. Does this make sense? Let, let, me, let me try to explain this a little bit better. I feel like I'm not explaining it super well. He's talking about clay pots, right? A, 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 a clay jar. And so this is, this is made of ceramic. This is made of clay. And, and this is essentially what Paul is telling us. Clay jars, they, they are delicate, right? If I, if I were to toss this to somebody and you didn't catch it, what would happen? It would break a whole bunch. I want to actually be careful with this because I like this jar. I'm not going to break it. Is it. Somebody take cap. Not on purpose anyways. <laughs> Please don't, please don't break my jar. But jar, the, these clay jars are delicate, yes? These, these clay jars, if you drop them, they are fragile and they will shatter into a whole bunch of pieces. The, 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 if you were to just even barely tap this thing with a hammer, it might crack, yes? Does this make sense? And so we got to be careful with these things. But even though they're fragile, that doesn't mean that they don't have a purpose, right? That doesn't mean that they don't have a creator that had a plan for them from the get-go, yes? Does this make sense? Yeah. That from the get-go, the, the, the potter sat down at the wheel and took this clump of clay and threw it on the wheel and had in mind what he or she was going to do as they were making this clay jar, yes? And they took extra special care to get every curve right. And to go through and make every single line and then to flatten out these handles and put them on. And then after all of that, the, the, the clay pot goes through this process called firing. How many of you have done pottery before? Anybody? And so it goes through this process called firing and you, you glaze it, you, you fire it, and then you glaze it, and then you fire it again, right? And all of these things are done in an effort to strengthen the pot. They're done in an effort to make this thing a, a, a little bit more sturdy, a little bit more durable, and, and, and a little bit more beautiful. Yes? Does this make sense? But even though it's durable now, even though it's more durable than it was at the, at the very beginning, even though it's more durable than, than it probably will ever be, Listen, listen, the slightest nudge destroys it, right? And so let me tell you this, let me tell you this, the, the pot went through a process, it was, it was formed and it was made on purpose, but the truth is, is even though it went through firing process and, and a glazing process, the, the, the durability of that pot is deceiving. Yes? The durability is deceiving. The pot, though it was formed, though it was made, though it was finished, was still fragile. The durability of that pot was deceiving. And friends, the same is true of us. Our durability is deceiving. And so Paul describes us as clay jars because God has taken special care to mold us, yes? In the hands of the master potter, we have been taken care of, we have been molded, we have been shaped, we have been made with a purpose that when God made you, he already had an idea in mind 
before what you were going to be and who you were going to be and what your life was going to look like. God already knew all of those things when he put you on the, the, the throw wheel. Does this make sense? But even though we're made by the master potter with an amazing purpose, we are still easily broken. Come on. The amazing thing is, though, is that God is at work in the middle of our brokenness, and, and, and he is glorified as we humble ourselves enough to be honest about where we are and allow him to begin to put us back together. That the master potter, that Jesus Christ himself came to earth and he was broken so that we could made whole, be made whole, that even in our brokenness, he could come in and he could take every single one of those pieces and he could put them back together and make them even more sturdy than they were before. Do you hear me? Does this make sense? It's in that process of being broken and being made whole that if we are transparent about it, if we're vulnerable about this, we get to point to the work that Jesus is doing in our lives. And so I, I, like, I like what verses 8 and 9 said. Can, can we throw 8 and 9 back up there? They say this, that we are pressed on every side by troubles. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like you got troubles coming at you from every side? It says we are pressed on every side, but because of Jesus, we are not crushed. That we are knocked down, but because of Jesus, we are not destroyed. That we are perplexed, but because of Jesus, we don't have to give in to despair. Yes? That God has not abandoned us. Why? Because God is able. And way too often we act like my three-year-old son who puts on a Spider-Man costume and tries to live out his fantasy of being Spider-Man and he wants everybody to believe that he is Spider-Man and he has to have the, the, the suit on to have the special abilities. God doesn't need a suit. God is able, yes? And so if you're here tonight and you've got your church costume on because you don't want anybody to know that you're hurting, you don't want anybody to know that you're broken, the Bible tells us that we are to carry one another's burdens. We can't do that if we don't know about them, right? I, I feel like there may be somebody in here that, that you are struggling. You're, you're carrying something all by yourself, and you put on your church costume because you don't want people to know what's going on deep down. You don't want people to know the, the pain that you feel, the anxiety that you are bogged down with, the stress, maybe the depression that you are suffering from. You don't want anybody to know that, so you put on a smile. You put on a, a, a costume so that nobody will know. Listen, if you're wearing a costume to cover up your hurt, you need to know hiding won't heal it. Yeah? If you are putting on a costume to cover up your hurt, you need to know and understand that, hurt, that, that, that hiding it is not going to heal it. And so in just a minute, worship team, you guys can come up. In just a minute... We're, we're going to spend some time in worship, and as we do, I'm going to ask my leaders, I didn't talk to them about this beforehand, but I'm going to ask all of my leaders in the room to just kind of spread out behind everybody worshiping back far enough that, that you can have a private conversation, and if that's you, if I'm talking to you, you, you put on the church costume because you don't want anybody to know that you are hurting and you are broken. If that's you, I want you to come and talk to one of our leaders tonight. We, we want to pray with you. We want to encourage you. We want to remind you of your value, that God still has a purpose for you despite what you were going through, and you don't have to remain broken because Jesus is able to put you back together, yes? But some of us in here have a church costume on because we want everybody to think that we are awesome. Some of us, we're, we're not hiding hurt. We're hiding sin, and we're hiding sin because we want people to think that we are more spiritual than we actually are. And, and friends, this is worse. The Bible calls this hypocrisy, and Jesus talks about this. Jesus points out the fact that if you are living this way, if, if you are putting on a spiritual facade, you're putting on a costume to make people think that you are so spiritual, Jesus says, you're a whitewashed tomb. What that means is you are cleaning up the outside of a grave knowing that inside of that grave the bones are dead, decaying, and dried up, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a heavy thing to hear from heaven. And so you need to know if, if you're wearing that costume to cover up your sin, trying to make people think that you are better than you actually are, listen, masking it will not remove the mess. I made a mess over here, right? Right? What if I just took a sheet and put it over it? Would that clean that mess up? No. 
it's not going to clean the mess up. I've got to come back, and I've got to clean this mess up. And the truth is, is we can't clean our own messes up. Can we bring, can we bring that track down? I, I can't clean up my own mess. I've got to have Jesus come into my life to clean up my mess, yes? And so if you're, if you're the one wearing that church costume because you want everybody to think that you're doing amazing, Jesus needs to come in and clean that mess up, you all hear me? Yes? Because the only thing that we're accomplishing by putting a costume on to make people think that we're better than we actually are is we're making a mockery of grace. And, and, and what happens is eventually we begin to believe our own hype. We begin to believe that we are actually doing better than we are. And that's a dangerous place to be because in James 4, 6, it says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. When we are so proud to think that we don't need help, that we don't need Jesus to come and fix our lives, that's a dangerous place to be because God resists that type of person. But says that he gives grace to the humble. And so we got to take off our costumes, y'all. Yes? I get it. Costumes can be fun this time of year. It's fun to dress up like Up. It's, it's, it's fun to dress up like Castaway. But there are no costumes in the kingdom because God sees beyond all of it. And Jesus knows our hearts anyways. And so we have to understand. Stand to your feet all across this place. We have to understand that the truth of the matter is, is that Jesus didn't die for the person that you pretend to be. Hear me? Everybody look up here. I know we're running short on time. I don't care. Jesus did not die for the person that you pretend to be. Hear me? Jesus died for the person behind the costume. Jesus died for the brokenness that you try to cover up. Jesus died for the hurt that you are drowning in and you haven't told anybody about yet because you're afraid that they're going to know too much about your life. That's what Jesus came for. He didn't come for the costume contest. So I ask everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. If, if you're here tonight and you've been hiding from Jesus, maybe, maybe you've never started a relationship with Jesus and, and you want to start a relationship with Jesus tonight because you're hearing the, the truth that Jesus can heal the broken places in your life. That all begins with a relationship with him. That all begins with coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I, I've messed up and I've sinned and I've failed, but God, you are good, and you died for me, and so I want to accept your gift of eternal life, and I want to put my trust, my life, my faith, my everything in your hands. Be my Lord, my leader, my Savior. If you want to make that decision, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand right now. I see that hand. Thank you. Is there anybody else? I see those hands. Thank you. Keep, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Maybe you're here tonight, and you have a relationship with Jesus, but you're the one who's been putting on the costume to cover up fact that you are addicted, to cover up the fact that you, you, you are just trying to put on a, a performance so that people will know how great you are in your faith, and you're realizing Jesus didn't die for the person that I pretend to be, Jesus died for the person that I really am, and I don't want God to resist me, I want his grace to abound in me, and so I'm going to take off the costume of performance, I'm going to take off the costume of, of trying to be uh, the best in people's minds. And I want to authentically come to Jesus. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Nobody looking around. Man, there's hands going up all over the place. That's awesome. We all got to get back to that place sometimes of taking off that, that, that fake costume and get to a place of authenticity with Jesus. Jesus, I pray for every single person with their hand in the air whether they're coming to you for the first time or whether they, they are deciding right now that they're done being fake in their faith and they want to come to you with authenticity. Jesus, I pray in both of these situations that you would rush in and that you would begin to do a mighty work and transform them from the inside out. God, if there is a mess, I pray that you would begin to clean up that mess and turn it into a message so that that light can shine for other people, that they would be pointed back to you and fall in love with you and be changed by you and that the cycle of the kingdom advancing through your people who are being honest and vulnerable would continue. Jesus, would you move in power and do what only you can do in the hearts and lives of those who are admitting to this right now. We love you, Jesus. Listen, we're going to go into a time of worship here. But if you're a part of the group, but you're wearing a costume because you want to hide your hurt, you want to hide your depression, you want to hide your addiction, you, you want to hide it 
because you're afraid of what people are going to think if they find out. The Bible tells us that we are to carry one another's burdens. So myself and my leaders, as you guys come forward, we're going to stand in the back. And we, if, if, if that's you, and you need somebody to come alongside you and encourage you right where you're at, I want you to come and talk to one of us. We want to pray with you. We want to encourage you. We want to love on you. And we want to help you lead to change. Yes? Awesome. You guys can come forward for worship. Thank you, God, that, that when, when, when we fail, when we can't, we know that you can, that you won't fail, that, God, you are enough. And, and, and in those broken places, Jesus, help us to turn to you. Help us to allow you to come in and, 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 and clean up our mess and, and, and take away the sin and the addiction and the struggles that we get so wrapped up in. Jesus, we pray that you would come in and begin to remove those things and transform us and give us a testimony of life change so that we can bring the light that you have put inside of us to the darkest places of our world. Jesus, I, I do pray that if there is anybody in here tonight that is, is struggling, depression, anxiety, self-harm, stress, worry, whatever it is that, that they, are, they are hiding deep within because they don't want anybody to know about it struggling by themselves. I pray that they would find the courage tonight before they leave this room to come and, and have a conversation with me or one of our leaders so they can find some hope in the middle of that so that they don't have to shoulder that burden alone. Jesus, we thank you again that you are good, that you are a firm foundation. We declare that we want to build our lives on you, not to cost you anything, not to mask anything, but to be vulnerable as we build our lives on you. We love you, Jesus. Everybody set?